So we are in chapter eight. We're going to start off with that. And then at the end of class, then we'll go over some things, some like housekeeping things for the future of the next couple of weeks of what we're going to be doing in class. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Actually, just an application. And we're going to start here with uh, technology in the workplace. I think from a technical standpoint, this chapter is probably one of the more important chapters that we've dealt with. This is when it, so when it has to do with technique and it has to do with process, the way we use technology in the workplace, I think, is extremely important. Um, and it is basically the way that we communicate. Um, there has to be a technical medium aspect to everything we communicate. Obviously, this class, right? Um, we can't see each other face to face. We have to depend on some form of technology to mediate um, for us to be able to communicate. And the modern workplace is that, is becoming more that. Um, it already was to some degree, uh, particularly people who are in IT, um, you know, form uh, virtual groups and form virtual communication pods. And they use all kinds of different uh, media platforms, you know, obviously Teams, Zoom, Skype, um, you know, have been in use for 10, 15 years. I remember, you know, almost 20 years ago, I was using um, a platform and I can't, I, my mind just blanked on what it was called, but it was kind of like go to my PC where I could um, tunnel from my home computer to my work computer and I could literally see the screen of my work computer and um, it mirrored it and I could control it. In fact, I, I um, have this really funny story where um, I was at work, I was working nights and I could do, I could go backwards, right? I could log in to my home computer from my work computer. And I logged on and I turned on the, the stereo uh, from my computer at home. And so all of a sudden my wife starts hearing this music coming from my office and she didn't think that there was anybody else at the home. And so that was kind of freaky, you know, but um, this is kind of what we have is this, these abilities to virtualize our communication and to project it far from where we are physically, right? So we're all in different places physically, but we can virtualize ourselves through media in order to um, be able to be together in a virtual sense. All right, so technology is important to cover distances. Um, and because it is important and, and because it has this impact, then there are certain really important uh, protocols and that are, that should be observed, certain etiquette that is critical for us uh, in, in the workplace. A lot depends on the, on the um, company that you end up working for, but it really doesn't matter what company, okay? Uh, this summer, I was working for the napkin company. Um, well, it's, it was called Kimberly Clark at one time, but, but it's a subsidiary of Kimberly Clark. It's called Green Bay Packing. Um, in downtown in the uh, in the industrial park, 
And basically, we made napkins and packed them in boxes all night long. However, just as the name implies, the company actually existed in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We were simply a shop. We were simply a warehouse with machines in it. And we provided the labor, but all the administration was in Green Bay. So if you got into the into the corporate side of the company, then they would literally fly you back and forth to Green Bay in order to meet with them. And they had daily or weekly meetings via Skype where all the all the uh, the mid-level management here in Hattiesburg and the administrators in Green Bay would have these virtual meetings and make decisions on hiring people and promotion and production and, you know, all the kind of decisions that a company has to make in order to continue. So Green Bay had figured out a way that they could rent a building, hire people, um, invest in raw materials here in Mississippi and turn a profit um, by outsourcing all these expenses to a state like Mississippi. Uh, it, it's really interesting. Um, some of the layers of that look like, so obviously there was the communication, the, the verbal communication between the mid-level management and the corporate uh, administrators in Green Bay, but everything else as well. So every machine that we used um, was connected to the web, right? So it was part of what is, has been called the Internet of Things, where you have all these sensors on machinery that can be collected in a database. All right, so we were running... Um, napkin cutters, napkin printers, napkin folders. Every time a piece of paper went through there, you know, it, it counts it, right? It automatically counts. The machine counts it. Well, that counting was registered, sent through the internet, and registered into the database there in Green Bay. And that not just that one machine, but all the machines, basically the same thing, right? So they could see, you know, how many napkins were being made, how many errors were made, you know, how many boxes of napkins were packed, how many pallets of boxes of napkins then were moved out. Um, they would scan, right? You have the, the little scanners now, the handheld scanners, and you could scan box by box as it was loaded in the truck. They could see how many they have in their warehouse, everything on the internet. And so the internet becomes the uh, an absolutely essential thing for this company to work. So technology is extremely essential. That, that just get that's one example of the impact that technology has in the workplace. Now, if we think about com communication, right, we use our little communication model. Um, let's go back to that for just a second. I'm going to pull back up one of our older, um, one of our older copies. I don't know if I have it on here. Just a second. Let me um let me stop sharing and then reshare from a different viewpoint. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share just my screen.
right. I'm going to download this for a second. Um, open up a file in our That's chapter seven. Seems like I should have chapter one here somewhere. Well, evidently not. All right. Okay, let's see. How do I share my whiteboard? Cancel. Can y'all see the whiteboard at all? Annotation. Okay, I know what I know how to do that. Sorry. Let's do it this way. Our screen. Yep. Share. Cool. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I apologize. I am wasting a lot of time here. Okay, so if we're uh, if we're drawing, say, and we're creating our um, we're creating our communication model. We all hopefully remember what the communication model looks like. Something is, it keeps dinging and not doing what I'm asking it to do. Okay. <sighs> mm -mm -mm. So we have a communication. We have the speaker speaks into speaker or communicator. Um, we have here in the middle the communication medium, what we call the channel. We have then the um, 
the message as it goes out to the listener. All right, you have the feedback loop. Hopefully y'all are have been in, in linguistics long enough and communication long enough that you actually remember this. So you got communication going one way, the message. The message is the packet that goes along the channel. Right? And then you have this channel can have what we call interference. Cool. All right, now, and that's enough. So depending on how laggy your internet communication is, how accurate your headset or your microphone is, um, how clear the person speaking is, how well your ears are working. All these things can be aspects that affect the interference of the message getting through to the listener, right? make the listener over here. Send to back. There we go. Cool. Okay. So the internet creates um, a particular set of interferences that we're having to deal with here. Okay, that's that's basically all I was going to say, and it took me 15 minutes to say that. Okay, so as we think about technology. Um, let's use some specific examples. First of all, the example of email. So this is one of the earliest forms, and this was actually used and useful before there was even hard drives. So back from the 70s and 80s, people, um, at least some people, mostly in the military and some special um, important organizations like IBM, uh, we're able to use email and we're able to um, r r type texts and pass those texts back and forth across the intranet as it was known back in those days, right? The message, the messaging system back and forth within that company. It wasn't until uh, 1993 when there was a protocol set up where different machines, different companies could communicate back and forth across each other. That was the WWW, World Wide Web um, Protocol, that allowed these intranet messages to then be um, distributed to all points on that network of servers. So there are some particular, and I say all this because we take it for granted, right? We all use email. We all use Facebook message. We all use text message. Um, those of you who have um, iPhones, right, aren't aware of how your text messages look on an Android. Right, maybe a few of you 
or Androidites. I don't. I'm not. I don't know. But um, you aren't aware of of you know what's happening there in Android land, and that even even though for the most part the SMS is getting through, right? The 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 um, simple text message is being sent. Um, there are certain aspects in which the message can be distorted, especially when it comes to emojis, right? Um, I message the Apple protocol that communicates between iPhones um, can send it so quickly. And then when it gets convert, it has to get converted to another system in order to communicate to an Android and it gets garbled every time. Right. And so sometimes like y'all will have gone on and, and had, you know, 10 responses um, in our group chat here on, on the team. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm having to go like go and click and download each one of these individually. And now they're all out of order because, you know, I. And I'm trying to figure out, all right, who said what first? And then they, and then the next person responded to them. Anyway, uh, first world problems, right? But this is just one illustration of how technology um, does affect. And so thinking through, be, being aware of this um, determines that we are going to have to be intentional in the way that we communicate. So SMS is great as long as it works, right? As long as you are aware of the lag, you're aware of the sequencing, um, you're aware of the person on the other end that is trying to receive that message, those are issues that have to be considered um, as we think of the communication model in terms of technology. Um, email, um, feels not as formal as sitting down and writing a letter. I don't know if any of y'all have ever experimented with um, handwriting letters. I'm not saying that you haven't. I just, um, I know some of my high schoolers never have, right? Um, so what they take for granted as having grown up with, you know, I had to learn, you know, from the time I was 10 and up, um, over a process of several years. And so I started out, you know, the old analog, write it by hand, fold it up, put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and mail it and then wait six weeks or eight weeks before somebody um, writes another one and email and writes it back, right? And then email comes along and it's like, oh, this is cool. So do we write our emails exactly like we do? You know, dear sir, you know, the business header with the address, uh, with the business address to and from. Do we um, give an introduction? Thank you for taking the time to read this message. Um, I hope this finds you well. We are doing well. Um, then the body of the letter giving the intention of it. You know, just as in, in business, you want to be concise and to the point, right? The reason I'm writing you is, and then you give then you give the reason and then um a formal closing thank you for this consideration um i hope this is i uh, hope this um you are will be in good health in the future um most sincerely your servant uh joshua rogers so whenever i get email like i we still do use email sometimes and I get emails sometimes from students and I will get like one line or two lines and they will, you know, dive in, say something and send it, you know, so they, a lot of times email is treated just like text message, except that sometimes I don't know who it is. I don't know what the context of the question that they have is. And so I am, um, you know, spinning my wheels. I have to go back and look up, okay, who is this person? What class are they from? What question are they asking me? Oh, this is talking about this assignment. Um, so 
there's a lot of context of information that hasn't been communicated that probably should be front loaded in a proper email context. All right, so that's something that needs to be um, thought through when you start using email as communication, right? You need to be aware of the other person. You know, let's take a, another example. All right, so we know that we are in that not only is email handy and it is the standard communication in business, but, you know, we live in the kind of the post WikiLeaks era in which people's emails have been splattered all over the internet, right? Just last week, uh, you know, I hate to bring this up, but um, there are people getting on and taking screenshots of, you know, um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, you know, they had been, they were literally in their office taking screenshots off of their computers and posting them on the internet. Before that, you had Hillary Clinton. Somebody dumped, you know, 30,000 of her emails. All right. Those messages back and forth, think about 30,000. How long does it take? How many negotiations? How much work is contained in 30,000 email messages, right? And you have to understand the context with it, the relationships behind it, you know, the the layering of of the 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 layering of contexts and understanding and collaboration and projects that that went around and underneath and above and beyond these emails that we're having that we can see tangibly. So communication is always about text within context. There's always and and that's hard um that isn't um that's one of the things that I haven't done well uh, at conveying, perhaps. But let's try that for just a minute. All right. So this is, we're going to call this context. And we're going to take out the fill. Um, the effect should be... Um, basically it should be op opaque, no fill. There we go. But everything around it should be, um, we're going to give it this term here, context, right? Everything that goes before it, goes after it, goes above it, below it, all this space around the actual message is context, right? Because there were messages previous, there will be messages after it, right? These, um, all of our communications are based on relationships. There actually has to be a relationship between speaker and listener of, of some kind, right? There has to be a tuning in. The speaker has to tune into the same channel that the listener, or the listener has to tune into the same channel that the speaker is conveying on. And that channel is part of the context within which the message is communicated. So email should make explicit the context. All right. That's my point here. Email should make explicit the context of what the text of the message is trying to convey. You know, who are you? Um, hopefully, you know, obviously the person that you're talking to may know you. Y'all may have had already dealings. May, they may know that you're already in the same class um, and that you are working on this project, that the particular question that you're asking is about this issue. So technology tends to make it feel like there's a connection, right? 
um, a virtual connection when that connection may be very thin, very sparse, right? Um, the literal words may be getting through, but the context may be missing. Let me use another example. So people, um, the, the opportunity to use a camera, video communication, you know, before it, it was, right, literally text messages. It was literally the characters. That was all that could be sent over wire because um, we didn't have the technology. And then later on towards the end of the 90s, then we could actually take a very, very, very pixelated picture and pass that over the internet, right? And then it got more, more deep um, detail in the picture. And then moving pictures, right? Video. As the um, infrastructure became more robust, then you could pass more packets of data over the wires and get whole videos, all right? Well, this video chat that we know, you know, today, uh, somebody was saying, you know, being able to use Skype, I don't know if y'all remember Skype 10 years ago, how grainy, how laggy it was, and now we sit and, and, and Zoom all day long, right? We even have debates on, online. So, um, this has provided some unique abilities for people who speak sign language, right? ASL speakers now can set up a camera and they can um, use their hands, their gestures in order to communicate very quickly, even though obviously they can read, they can text, but now um, having that virtualization of seeing the other person in the camera and, you know, being able to be seen using their hands, that's nice. But um, there's been some very interesting communication articles on, again, context being missed from in the, in the um, video frame because people who speak sign language use their whole body. They use facial features. They use um, vocalization. They use, you know, their hands, but also their hands in three dimensions, right? So it's um, close and far. It's this way. It's this way. Um, three dimensions of of them being and plus all the contortions and uh attitudes of their body as part of the syntax of american sign language and that by communicating via video it reduces three dimensions to two right there is a new there is a simulation of three dimensions right and maybe y'all have been to a movie that has 3D and it's you know it's kind of a little trippy on the mind but context is missing by missing that third dimension right so that is another example of how uh, technology flattens what we say. Um, when you text something, we try to um, communicate via emojis, right? We want to put these little circles with I, um, you know, we have the syntax of, of eye shape, of nose shape, of mouth shape, of eyebrow shape, um, that we use as syntax to communicate emotion, and yet at the same time, they're lacking in the nuance. They're lacking in the three dimension. And so, um, it, 
it can cause, you know, just, we've talked about communication is broken. In a broken world, there's no perfect communication. Communication is broken. Um, even sitting in, um, you know, face to face with one another, with the people who you love the most and you understand the most, there's still going to be miscommunication. And the more threads of context that we take away, the more susceptible the communication is to be ambiguous and to be misunderstood. So the more intentional we have to be in order to clarify what we're trying to say. So that's the drawbacks of technology, right? Um, they use uh, they talk about other things that technology can be invasive. Um, I, I experienced that. Um, we literally have these cameras in the ceiling in, in our in our high school now that track my movement back and forth. Um, and that's just I don't know. It's unsettling to think that doesn't matter what I say or um, you know somebody that's not in the room that doesn't hear the context of everything can like pop on and and view like 20 seconds or 30 seconds of something and then assume all kinds of things simply from um, that. Why did they put that, these cameras up there? Well, um, ostensibly it is simply to be able to communicate for our virtual students at home. Right. Um, we have we have students in person and we also have virtual students and ostensibly the people at home are going to feel more like they're in the room, you know, with these these high uh, 4K cameras. But, you know, there are other side effects of that that just kind of feel weird. Um, and that's that's kind of what it's talking about here. Employee surveillance, workplace surveillance systems. There's nobody, you know, you, you hear all these people that are freaking out about um, the government listening in. Yeah, the government definitely can listen in and they do. But somebody has to be on the other end actually monitoring that, you know, is it so is there one person to watch us for every person who is doing something? And the answer is, of course, no. So um, you have one person who is given the job of monitoring, right? A thousand other people, ten thousand other people. There's no, there's no possible way that they can actually monitor those things effectively. So, in a sense, you know, our lives can be hidden in the shuffle of everyday life. But at the same time, if somebody does, for some whatever reason, catch your attention and start looking, they're going to miss the whole context in which um, the things that they're looking at were played out. And so they miss and they misinterpret and misunderstand and misapply the law. So those are some of the real issues that we have with surveillance. You know, and that's why we have privacy laws. And, you know, um, uh, and especially like right after 9-11, that became a huge debated issue in, in the, the Senate. It's kind of died down because everybody just kind of accepts, yeah, we're going to be surveilled. People can listen to your, you know, through your phone at any time. They can listen through your computer. You know, you still have these people who put little stickers over their, 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 um, computer camera and and you know that's fine that's that's perfectly fine uh but um i mean it it's kind of almost part of our lives that we we don't even really register it or think about it that much um so there's the intrinsic drawbacks of technology in the technology itself. And then there's these uh, drawbacks of technology in time management. And this is where I fall in, in the gap, right? So supposedly I have Facebook. And in fact, I have two Facebook profiles, one for William Carey 
you know, as a professional Facebook um, profile and one that, that I've had for years that has just family and close personal friends. And the funny thing is that I'm never on either one of them. So if people actually try to get a hold of me, you know, it's like never going to happen. Um, when I do, if I get on there once a month, you know, I have no idea what the context of, of half of the, the thing, the posts that I'm seeing are right. Oh, that so-and-so was doing this. Oh, that's cute. You know, um, so-and-so's little girl had another birthday. You know, I'd forgotten that, you know, I checked on their birthday three years ago. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's so literally our human limitations to the amount of time we can spend, um, our divided attention between all the different media, right? So it's impossible for me to check, like, how many email accounts do I have? Probably, uh, I can think of seven. Um, and, the, and I have them all synced to one inbox, right? So I can literally read them all, but they all come from different sources, from different companies, from different circles of friends, and then two Facebook accounts, um, a Pinterest account, an Instagram account, actually three Pinterest accounts, one for my PCS Latin and one for my um, linguistics, and on and on and on. You know, I don't have to tell you everything, but you get the picture it is impossible for me to give attention to all these streams, right? So you have to think, okay, you have to think in st strategically, what is the purpose of these things? We kind of have to compartmentalize our lives and we do anyway, right? We have different circles of friends and we, um, we, play different roles in different people's lives, right? With your family, you are a, a son or a daughter and you're a cousin and you're an aunt or you're a brother-in-law, you know, or you're, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't think any of y'all are married yet, but you know, you're a parent. Um, uh, you know, so you have all these different roles. Then, you know, in your church, you are a, you know, a contributor. You are in your work. You are an employee at school. You are a classmate. So you have all these different roles. Um, and th just the sheer limitation of human of of our human nature. You know, how do we juggle all these personalities? And how does that, how do we, this is the, to me, of an extremely important thing. How do we maintain integrity? How do we be ourselves with all these different people? In, uh, you know, with this kind of splintered representation. And different people only see one particular side of us. So I think that's very important. And it should de determine, you know, how we present ourselves that we have, you know, so what, what a lot of companies do and what we, you know, you as an individual may, may want to think about doing is, uh, and I, I, I kind of like this concept and kind of, um, don't like it at the same time, but think about a personal brand, right? What is the version of yourself that you want to share? You know, and when I say brand, that sounds very plastic, right? It sounds very like facade, but when I, but I want you to think about as a, as a, um, as a person, as yourself, how do you represent yourself with the best integrity, right? How do you be real with your, you know, I, you've heard, 
uh, those of you especially that have been in the uh, speech and debate circuit have heard all the stories about, you know, being who people want you to be on, you know, um, taking off the filters on Instagram or, or you know, um, so those are aspects of, of what we're talking about here. But, you know, even, even if you choose a filter, you know, we are, we're all struggling with this, trying to make decisions on, you know, how are we going to represent ourselves? You know, how are we going to be true? If, if the medium that we're using only conveys such a sh small part of who we are, that it ends up in a sense, almost telling a lie about who we are, how do we enhance what is communicated in order to present as accurate, as three-dimensional a perspective as we can. I, I honestly think that's part of what's going on sometimes with putting filters um, through some of these communications. I don't think it's an intention to mislead necessarily as it is to represent ourselves as more than two-dimensional. And so those are, uh, I think, really important uh, concepts. And, and you have to kind of come from a place of, you know, who you are, what do you believe? How do you represent yourself um, in, you know, in your different, and, and it has to come from a place of character, it has to come from a place of integrity, if branding, and that's fine, you know. Um, so perhaps some of you, I, I know in other classes I've, uh, used a text called The Seven H Habits of Highly Effective People, right? Stephen Covey. And I went through that uh, back in 1999, and it was one of the best books that, I, that I've ever gone through, is it said, write a mission statement. So it took me a while. Um, you know, I went through the, I went through the book, I, I did the exercises, and it was about six months later after this had been percolating in my brain for a while when I finally said, okay, this is what I'm about. This is who I am. This is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to represent myself as. And so writing that mission statement, being able to put it in one sentence, even if it's a complex sentence, you know, what are the main, what is the main value, the main importance in your life? And then that that um, can encapsulate and incorporate everything else in your life. That this is, you know, all these splintered shards of our image, all these splintered shards of our communication, how can we make them fit into one clear definitional um, image? You know, and so... I, I challenge y'all to do that. I don't know if you're going to do it in this class, um, but having this sense of who you are, what you want to do, what you're going, at least at least some sense. I'm not, I don't mean that you have to have everything figured out. So please don't hear this anxiety-driven, I've got to have everything figured out. But rather, it's the ability to just kind of set back and let yourself set and say, no, this is who I am, right? As a human, as a human. We, we tend to define ourselves in, you know, this is what I do, this is what I like, this is how I act. And all those are, 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 are aspects of who we are. But, you know, after 50 years, you know, who are you? Looking back, who are you? You know, over, your, over the last 20 years, who are you? Um, and then the things you do, the relationships you have, all come out of that sense of who you are. You know, and I mean... Uh, I'm sure y'all probably know it by now, but whenever I wrote my mission statement, um, it had two 
two independent clauses, right? The top line of my life is the glory of God. The bottom line of my life is to serve people, right? Those are the two things. And so everything else somehow fits within that context, right? Who am I? You know, I am someone who has been um, created and rescued and remade by God. And so therefore, you know, the glory of God kind of permeates every other aspect, whether I'm working a job, whether I'm packing napkins, or whether I'm posting on Instagram to my little Latin followers, you know, uh, so I have a little Latin Instagram thing where I, and I kind of neglected it. I did it over the summer and then I neglected it and then I started posting again, but I'll just give like a couple of phrases or, or a picture and it's called Hortus Latinus, the Latin garden. And, you know, that fits in with my interest in, you know, God's creation and how that ministers to other people. Um, you know, it, it all fits. It all, to me, I, I can see how it all fits together. My, my passion for communication, my passion for literature, my passion for translation. All these are, right, ministering to fellow man. So... And I know I'm kind of rambling here. Hopefully, uh, this is helpful. So, in our textbook, when we come to our textbook, um, there they have the um, some key kind of assessments. I don't know if y'all, any of y'all were able to get the textbook. That's fine. I'm going to upload the the PowerPoint here shortly. Uh, but page one ninety six, two hundred. There we go. Okay. So tools for professional excellence, use technology with professional etiquette following these best practices, voicemail. You should have, um, you might want to take a screenshot of this. Um, if not, I'm going to take a screenshot and I'm going to upload. It'll be part, um, it'll be on the PowerPoint that I upload. But these are important things, right? Regor record your own greeting. Part of your branding. You know, who do you represent yourself? If people call my phone number, they get an email that says, um, I'm either on the other line or I am in class. <laughs> I mean, that's the definition of my life, right? I'm either on the other line or I'm in class. Um, and so they can leave uh, a message there. Right? Indicate if you will be out of the office, refer the caller to another person for help. If you have, so that's an important um my William Carey, I don't have it set up, but um, this just triggered. I need to have a way that someone who calls me at work can go to get a hold of Miss Gina, right, or Dr. Knight. Voicemail, when you're leaving a message, speak clearly and slowly. Leave your name and number. Keep messages short and to the point. Remember, most machines shut off after 60 seconds, some 45. So you want to be able to get um, your, from the, from the beep, you want to get your name, your number, the reason of your call, and any other pertinent information within 45 seconds. Also leave time and date. Ringtones. Use a silent or vibrate. Yeah, my phone is constantly on vibrate. It's, um, I just don't. Uh, I don't have a time when I'm not doing something else. So, um, I constantly have it on vibrate. 
If I am sleeping or taking a nap, I will put it on do not disturb, right? And set an alarm. That's that's my personal um, um, protocol, right? If I'm going to take rest, I'm going to be very intentional in my taking rest. And I will put on do not disturb and put on an alarm. So I'm like from this point to this point, nothing's going to disturb me. It doesn't matter, you know. With, with a couple of exceptions, I have two numbers that will ring on my phone in my do not disturb. And that's, of course, my, my wife and my family. But for the most part, you, you need to have those personal boundaries, right? Many ringtones are unprofessional. Use the standard ones if you're going to have it on. Text messaging, don't replace all communication with texts. Use texts that leave little room for misunderstanding. There you go little room that doesn't mean speak less sometimes it means speak more don't deliver bad or good news in a text right it should be face to face important decisions important communication and i've put off telling people something so that i can sit down and look them in the face and say okay here it is this is what it's like don't use test messages to have a conversation Sometimes somebody will text me and ask a question and then I'll answer them and then that'll spark three more questions. At that point, I'm like, are you free? I'm, and I'll pick up the phone and I'll literally call them because I was like, we're, we're missing each other every other word in this conversation. Um, and so you have sometimes you have to pick up the phone and say, hello, this is me. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, can you understand? Don't type in all caps. <laughs> That's um, a pet peeve. Don't answer your phone during a meeting, obviously, right? Unless it's an emergency. I mean, there has to be a good reason. Again, set it on do not disturb and alarm. There has to be an extremely good reason why this phone call takes more priority than what everybody else in the room is doing, right? If you're in a meeting, that's because, um, you know, people need your presence or you need their presence. Don't talk, take personal calls at work, again, unless it's an emergency. Twitter, keep posts clear and concise. Watch what you post. Before you post anything, consider what your family, friends, coworkers, or boss might think. Don't post all the time. Go for quality over quantity. Don't be selfish. Use your posts to support others around you. Don't post while under the influence of alcohol. Don't go overboard with symbols or emoticons, emojis. So those are some um, key things. Um, I I don't know that I have to tell you uh, about how to how to mitigate your personal um, profile on social media, right? That. Um, most people at, you know, if it's posted on the internet, it might as well be on the new, on headlines because somebody's going to find it, right? Whether it is Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr or LinkedIn, um, people have access or Snapchat. Um, it's somewhere, it's on some server and it can be, and the people in your con con connection are going to, f um, you know, there are people that are going to find it. Um, so that's the other extreme, right? So some people are like, well, I don't have anything to hide. And so then they just like blah, right? Put everything about themselves out there on the internet. They live in this public space. And, you know, that's, that's the other extreme, right? We literally have homes and we close doors and we pull curtains in our homes because there are certain things that happen in private versus what happens in public. And being able to have healthy boundaries about, you know, conversations that happen in private, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to pick on this guy because it was so disturbing but over Christmas we were in Walmart 
And you had this guy who was literally having a screaming um, discussion with some significant other on the phone. And you could hear him 10 aisles away in Walmart. Walmart is not where you have discussions about differences with your significant other. It's not, that's not the place, right? Nobody wants to hear, you know, the context of what you're talking about. And nobody sure doesn't want to hear all your cussing at this other person, you know. Anyway, pet peeve. Um, but those kind of things can come back. Um, people have access to it and it will color the way they perceive you or what they think about you as a professional. And so think about being professional. You know, if there can be one term, one encapsulating term, you know, so private versus public is not a is not a breaking point of your integrity okay your it, it, your integrity should flow into having certain boundaries and and having layered relationships right because of your boundaries because you are a person of integrity then you give different people different levels of access to you and um, and I know we all have our dysfunctions. We all have our relationships that work and don't work. And this is always a struggle. It's not just a a black and white, you know, one thing. But it's something that we should think through, something that we should work towards, and hopefully grow into as professional communicators. All right, that's all I have on chapter. Eight. Um, I'm I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's super critical here. Um, all right, let me stop sharing the screen for a minute. I'm going to stop the recorder and then start it again. So in the class, we have a couple of things coming up. One is um, your, I think at the end of this week, is do your, your final draft of your um, resumes and um, job, uh, your interest letters that, uh, that accompany your resume for applying for a particular job. Okay. Um, I've been thinking about how to do a, a, a true mock. Next week, we're going to do the um, role-playing interviews where your partner is going to take your resume and your cover letter, and they're going to prepare uh, a list of questions and interview you, and then you're going to do the same thing for your partner. Okay, so we're going to do that next week. Um, in that, um, I'm going to have you sign up for next week. I'm going to, that's going to be posted in Canvas. You're going to sign up. You're going to have a 20 minute um, slot, and then I'm going to record each of these, right? Each of these pairs of two uh, for the for um for the purpose of that assignment the third part of the mock interview is supposedly i'm having a, an interview with somebody you know in the real world i don't know that that's going to be possible but what i was thinking of many of you have had a recent job experience you know have have gained a job and I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you simply write up a reflection paper on what was the interviewing experience like, even if you didn't get the job. Like I know uh, Gala was interviewing with Netflix. I, I, that really piqued my interest. I, I, I congratulate her on just putting herself out there and having those, those access, you know, um, but 
uh, kind of right up, you know, how did you get access to this person? Um, what was the circumstances of the interview? Um, what were some things, you know, what were some of the questions? If you can remember, what were, what were you thinking? How did you present yourself? And how do you think it went? Um, and so I think that's the way we're going to have to do um, for the mock interview in this case. So we're going to do the, the role playing and then we're going to do kind of a reflection on, on interviewing. Um, and we're going to, I think that's the way that this particular thing is going to go. Um, let's see. Next week is group presentations. Well, actually, I take that back. It's Wednesday is group is our first group presentation. So there are three groups. Um, and so hopefully y'all are prepping that, practicing that, and we'll be ready to present that on Wednesday. Um, I think that's all I had. Let me see here. Okay. Um, dumb full resume cover letter, LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn profile. Yeah. I said resume cover letter, but also LinkedIn profile. So those three things um, should be should be posted by the end of this week. Are there any questions? All right. All right. If not, then y'all have a great Monday afternoon. And I will see y'all later. Some of y'all momentarily.
You are currently the only person in this conference.